Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Vinicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on thesseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today I have Daryl Becker, who is coming in from the Big Island uh, in Hawaii. He's a acupuncturist, Chinese herbalist, um, practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine in general. Um, he's a voluntarist and advocate for the Trivium and uh, nonviolent communication. His website is voluntaryvisions.com and his Facebook group is Voluntary Visions. And we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, his path to voluntarism and how that relates to traditional Chinese medicine uh, because we are both practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Not too many of us um, that uh, are, are also voluntarists. Um, and, uh, and also his thoughts on nonviolent communication uh, peaceful parenting and relationships, um, because that's an awesome topic that I think a lot of anarchists can uh, use some help in. <laughs> so, Daryl, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I heard about you uh, from Nick Hazelton. He had you on his show. He's like, "You got to get Daryl on. You guys are so much in common." <laughs> so I'm like, "All right." <laughs> so uh, yeah, we we uh, connected, and uh, you know, you seem to have a lot in common with me, which is very cool, very interesting. Um, so I'm like, "How often are you going to meet a, uh, you know?" acupuncturist herbalist voluntarist in, in your lifetime <laughs> it's not too common uh, but uh, but yeah so um so yeah please get into a little bit of of your path uh to voluntarism i guess chinese medicine came first with you and then voluntarism so yeah so so please uh, share with my audience your your history sure so how i started into holistic medicine as i like to think of it and then eventually I settled on which gang am I going to go into? And I settled on the gang of the, the Oriental Medical Gang, basically. You know, um, I had health problems. I got introduced to a holistic healthcare practitioner who was a chiropractor who in Vermont also did acupuncture. And eventually after some years, he invited me into his practice to work as his assistant. I apprenticed to him for about four years. And... After the first year, he found me an Oriental Medical College to go through the training so that I could eventually gain a license. He understood that in this world, it does help to have a medical license if you practice medicine as a form of protection, which that's what I was mentioning. That's kind of like joining a gang. Mm -hmm. Like, Are you going to go Crips or Bloods? What are you going to do? <laughs> you want some protection. So I chose the Oriental Medical Gang um, due to the ease of things and and the more I researched it, the more I found that it it had a great deal of benefits. Uh, it's one of the forms of medicine that's the least under attack, in my opinion, hmm. compared to, say, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, osteopaths. Hmm. Many of them often can have huge repercussions if they go down certain holistic healthcare paths for their clients. But for us, in our field, with our license, not so much. There's a great deal of acceptance. So... That's been some 18 years now going down that path, and that's also what brought me to move to the Big Island. Um, I went through Oriental Medical College the first time, and I didn't do the good enough research to find out that the school was majorly in trouble. So after I graduated and took a year off, I found out that the, year, the, the school had closed down and that I could not get a license there in Vermont. And so I sat on it. I, I literally practiced under the table for a while trying to figure out what I was going to do until I found a way to basically find a college that would accept me and I would have to go through Oriental Medical College all over again. So that's why I moved to the Big Island of Hawaii to go through Oriental Medical College all over again and figured if I was going to do that much, I'd like to do it in a nice setting. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why I chose to move here. Hmm. 
And upon moving here, I was thinking and listening to the beginnings of podcasts back then in 2008 when I moved here. And I came upon James Corbett, the CorbettReport.com. I started uh, basically coming upon all types of esoteric information, RedIceCreations.com, and the interesting shows on that, and GnosticMedia.com. Uh, that was with Jan Irvin. And through those venues, I got introduced to some interesting people. One of them especially was Brett Vinat, who was just starting up his podcast, School Sucks podcast basically a school sucks project.com and in one show of listening to brett speak on the subject of voluntarism and voluntary interactions as juxtaposed to coercive interactions and instantly it was like um the light hit me i i saw that there was no longer any real reason for coercion of any form or collectivism for every form. I was starting to see many different pieces of the puzzle coming together. Because before that, back in Vermont, I was voting Democrat. I was thinking in terms of what is often called a modern-day liberal. I was thinking in, in that format. I was afraid of guns. I was, uh, I was basically not trusting the general choices of the average person, but instead looking for... I would say coercive restrictions upon people, but then still knowing that there was a lot of corruption going on. Mm. Moving here, listening to these podcasts, Brett's show, he introduced me to Wes Bertrand. And he, Wes Bertrand has the Complete Liberty podcast, which he, he did for a number of years. Um, it's an excellent production. That was pretty much a way of you know opening it up, That and, and also Free Domain Radio with Stefan Molyneux. It, it very much like, you know, for, for the beginner person, it, it sews up questions that are really important to ask. And then in finding my own set of answers, some of which were supplied by these people I mentioned, but I found some of my own answers. I was connected to a variety of people through Wes Bertrand. He basically created a very excellent little Google Plus Hangout that I, I was accepted into to train in nonviolent communication. That's a thing that I'm also known for on the internet. So, yeah, that was a, a big, long rambling of how I came to be this way. And right now, when I go on people's podcasts, they are often asking me, Daryl, what's the trivium? Daryl, what, what is nonviolent communication? Mm -hmm. And what is it that's different about the way you do it versus other people and the way they use those tools? And, and that's often what I cover. But, yeah, you're right. You know, you and me, as licensed acupuncturists and holistic healthcare providers – we we don't find a lot of our kindred who are also like-minded you know in terms of we've studied bigger questions of economics mm -hmm. and regulatory capture mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. opportunity cost and all mm -hmm. these very fascinating concepts that when you ask the questions and you really seek substantial answers it really goes somewhere and what i found in my colleagues and maybe you I'll ask about how you found your classmates who when you went through school they're just busting their butts trying to get through school right <laughs> and they're just really trying to learn these things for the first time yeah. when i went through oriental medical college twice in the second time i basically was getting a nice review on things plus getting the nuances of other things like really really relearning things in a more substantial way and that gave me a lot of free time to learn other subjects such as what is voluntarism what is the non-aggression principle what is Nonviolent communication. What is the trivia method of critical thinking? And answering those, I found that there were amazing possibilities to put them together and people like you out there. So, um, yeah, a lot of my colleagues, they really become very focused on just getting through. And then after they get through, they're just trying to make ends meet. It's like as if they don't have a lot of time as entrepreneurs. But I'm thinking that as I check in with them over the years, they they again to they tend to lean more and more towards this philosophy of, I would be say, very respectful of personal choice and very reluctant and distrustful of things that are coercive externally, things that are extrinsic motivators, such as punishments and rewards. So um, yeah, that that in a nutshell. Perhaps I took too long on that, but that's how no, I came to these philosophies. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's beautiful. Um, I 
Let's see. Talking about my my uh, colleagues. Yeah, I, I, when I went to school, the uh, Oriental Medicine College, I uh, did have that similar feeling that people were struggling. And um, I mean, with me, I always attribute the fact that I absolutely loved the information that I was learning, you know, about the acupuncture nerves. So it wasn't really a chore and it wasn't difficult for me. I loved it. I retained it. I, uh, I I was just devouring books left and right during college, not on economics and volunteerism, but on, on Chinese medicine. And I, I, I had so many books, um, you know, in addition to school that I was reading <laughs> just because I love the topics. Um and so that was fun. Um, yeah, the um, what was it? There's one Paul Paul Pitchford. Um, um, what's it called? Healing with whole healing with Fo- whole foods. Healing with whole <laughs> foods. There's a the the Tao of health, sex, and longevity. There's um, a bunch of a bunch of really good ones that I got um, that were not like you know required reading, but I just devoured all of them because it's just such awesome content. Uh, I thought it was really cool. I got I got a big poster. Um, that showed you know had a big yin yang symbol, and then in in uh, in the yin yang symbol had all the foods uh, arranged according to uh, you know taste temperature channels organs entered and all that, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, so you can you know easily see at a glance um, the uh, the characteristics of of food in terms of each nutrition, and then I also got a big another big poster of like uh, like the like 450 herbs that I learned. Uh, and mm-hmm. you know a little picture of them and the name of it. What is it underneath? So you could look at it as a, at a glance. And so yeah, all this stuff I got I early got into it, and uh, and I just saw my my um, yeah my um, fellow students just struggling, and I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? With-? You know, they're like they're like, man, I pulled an all all nighter, didn't sleep anything last night. <laughs> I was downing a you know Red Bull just studying for this test. I'm like, what are you talking about? I slept fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, so didn't really have a problem with that, and, and then after college, I just kept studying uh, different things, you know, and and my path, uh, you know, through holistic medicine, you know, took me to learn more about GMOs and vaccines and Monsanto, and uh, you know, Dupont and those guys, and then the, you know the crony. Uh, corporations and uh, you know why they're so evil everybody you know I was just actually uh, talking with somebody recently Uh, we were on a camping trip and I was talking to this one guy and and it's like I I, I realized something that I think it's very easy for people to look at like Chase or Bank of America or Halliburton or Monsanto or DuPont or Syngenta and they look at these huge corporations right or let's say Chevron in Texaco and they're destroying the environment they're polluting you know small villages they're you know wreaking havoc they're 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 supporting war you know they get rich off of war uh, and then the reconstruction after war um and so they look at these corporations and like this is why capitalism sucks this is why business is evil and it's so tempting to look at it like that and i think i did as well um and then you once you learn more about economics and the nature of the state and uh, anarchy and things like that uh, you gain a deeper understanding about why uh, they're like that, and and there's a there's a phrase that I like, which is hate hate the game, not the player, right? So if there exists an institution of of violence and power, um, then of course certain companies will want to appeal to that institution to gain favors and protection and immunity, right? It's only natural that they would want to do that. Uh, and 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 through using that institution, um, destroy their competitors, right? Through protectionist laws and regulations and minimum wage laws and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and only later it made sense to me, like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's not that they're not the root. You know, it's like it's like you 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 destroy Monsanto and Chase and all those, and it's like cutting off the heads of the Hydra. The way I look at it, you know, just another one's going to grow back. Another one's going to grow back. I think when. The confusion happened, like in that little statement that you just said, where people are bearing witness intellectually and emotionally to the situation of Monsanto and people in the war machine and profiting on the front end and on the back end. And then they're coming to that conclusion, capitalism is what that is, and Mm. it's evil. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is the problem of definition. Mm -hmm. Which brings it back to why am I such a proponent for having an explicit or explainable method of critical thinking? 
is because when you actually define your terms, you would find out that what you're act- what a person like that is actually defining is closer to socialism or communism. Mm. What they're defining is a coercive centralized control mechanism, an actual private enterprise, a classical definition of capitalism, is mostly just the respect of people's freedom to choose and make whatever choices that they want, an actual respect of ownership, boundaries, and property, which in its essence is the lack of all conflict. When you have ownership, boundaries, and property respected across the line, then you're going to have lack of conflict because everyone is is you know set in their boundaries they're with they're staying within their boundaries everyone knows each other's boundaries and things move back and forth on a voluntary basis and that's pretty close to the, what capitalism actually would mean and when you don't know your definitions you'd be pointing to these things that involve regulatory capture because you haven't studied economics so you don't even know the term regulatory capture mm-hmm. you haven't studied what even rent-seeking behavior means. Um, what's, what's it like when your business, such as an acupuncture license, is so regulated that it, it costs that much to enter into the field? Mm-hmm. And most of my colleagues, maybe a bunch of yours, are sitting on debt, serious mm-hmm. debt. Another reason why some of our colleagues work their butts off and do, they don't have spare time to investigate these topics that we're, we've spent the time on. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you can make the time you could also just happen to be gifted like you are and just happen to easily memorize and spit back information back in the testing days of the early aughts back when you were tested. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember because I was, you know, I went through tests, some small versions of testing back then. The tests were easier back then, I might got to tell you. Um, the tests for acupuncturists nowadays are, in most states, they are, the board exams are considerable. Hmm. They are adaptive frequently, an adaptive computerized test. You get 150 minutes, 100 questions. The timer is ticking down now. Hmm. You have one chance to enter, to enter the correct answer or not for every question. You need 70 of the questions correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got me so far? Yeah. And mm-hmm. every single time that you happen to enter the wrong question, the computer will note that. And it has about 30, 35 different categories of knowledge for each test, right? So if you started getting cupping questions wrong or gua sha questions wrong, as I did, it will start throwing you more and more gua sha questions and more cupping questions. Mm. And imagine that the test is now becoming more of a gua sha cupping test. Hmm. It's now like getting serious. Like they're Mm. really trying to bust me on this, Hmm. you know? That's an adaptive test. So the difference between if you went through your board exams 10 years ago or more it to right, right now for the present day batch of acupuncturists, it, the, the pressure upon these modern day acupuncture students to get their board, you know, to get through their boards is phenomenally different. Hmm. And if you were a teacher or a professor in an acupuncture college, as I was a few years ago, you understand that internally as because I've been through this several times, you know, Mm. um, I mean, I, I started my education technically my first oriental medical class, 1999. Okay. Pretty close to when you started. Right. Um, and back then it was far easier back then a paper test would do one test to get your license, Mm -hmm. you know, and you certainly get all the time you, you know, like the specified amount of time and you could change your answers. Mm hmm. And so anyone who went even further before me to get their license, they had a whole different barrier to entry. So it's it's as if um, it's like this this crazy race in in this regulatory capture of our business where they kept adding hurdles and other events like pole vaulting and stuff to the event of becoming a proficient practitioner. And all it does is make really compliant practitioners who are really good at memorizing and spitting things back, not Mm. necessarily achieving clinical results. Hmm. And they get back, they get into the world, as I find out, as some of my colleagues have. And there is the struggle because then they have to actually completely adapt, throw away most of what they had to do to get through the boards, throw most of it away. And they just need to be practical. They need to achieve and make a portfolio of cl- pleased clientele. So what I will su- – I, here's what I predict, Daniello. Um, I predict that more of our colleagues as they – the ones who stay in acupuncture, the ones who don't give up, as I know some who do, um, the ones who stay will learn more and more about 
how awful coercive regulation is for everyone and everything, and in no way does it protect people. And more and more they're going to learn how wonderful it is to have voluntary situations in their life, to, to pay, have cash under the table and not pay out for that. Or maybe even some of them accepting Bitcoin payment for their services, you know. Mm. So um, my prediction is, is there'll, be more of, there'll be more folks like us entering into this philosophy. Let, let, let me play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, what people would often tell me if I were to give that explanation, they'd be like, well, um, you know, Daryl, it's, it's true that, um, you know, life would be better if we all engaged in voluntary interaction. Everybody understood property rights and non-aggression. We all respect each other. But that's not reality. You're never going to convince everyone that that's the case. So, therefore, your idea will never work. What, what would you say to somebody like that? I say to look at their own life right now and how much of their interactions with people in their personal life are voluntary. I would say to look at their own life and analyze that right then. And I think that what I want to know is, like, seriously, how much of their life is really going to be respectful of other people's choices? When you want to go out with your wife do you, uh, and some friends or, like, a whole some of your friends or, say, like, a bunch of people, do you vote on it? on where you're going or do you have a discussion and is it more of a consensus based thing where you everyone is getting the feel for everyone else and what their preferences are mm. and everyone is getting an idea because if someone like look I'm really allergic I can't go to that restaurant and like yeah well we're not going there because he's really allergic to the MSG that's in that restaurant so we're not going to go there and because we like this we want him we because we value being with the person more than you know going to number one chinese <laughs> right you know and that's an understanding so when i would ask people about their personal choice in their life it's mostly voluntary now if people are doing things that are dis disagreeable to them such as working in jobs that are disagreeable to them or being in marriages that are disagreeable to them or other situations like that living in a place with a landlord that's disagreeable to them that is already a setup of conflict right then and there. So when you live within conflict on a day-to-day -day basis, you could probably easy fall, easily fall into the trap of convincing yourself that the world is like that. And because it's disagreeable to you, you would prefer that disagreeable things are forced upon others. Mm -hmm. This is a philosophy. Uh, some have called it sour grapes. <laughs> you know, um, when I was a professor teaching acupuncture students when I was, I got to do that for a couple of years, um, 2012, 2014, I mostly understood that what the students were going through was harsh and problematic, just as I was forced to go through it. And all I wanted to do was explain to me, explain that to them, that I understood that it was harsh, unnecessarily harsh. It was like giving them extra hurdles and uh, other pole vaulting events to do that were it, completely going to be dropped and thrown away and forgotten as soon as they got to their license. And all I was going to do is to try to f give them all the tools I could to make it easier for them, to, make, to, to help them through that, to show them how to get through it easier, to tell them what of the four functions does it serve. Is it simply just to pass tests, which is academic? Is it clinical useful? clinically as an acupuncturist, is it useful to communicate to other acupuncturists, like having the nomenclature, such as if I said, foot shao yin shu, and that would, you know, that instantly you can communicate to an acupuncturist when you say those words. I just said kidney deficient, you know, to people who don't speak our language, mm. you know. And, and if you don't understand what I meant by kidney, you also still wouldn't understand what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's not just the organ. Yeah. And and so then the fourth function, to speak to medical practitioners in other fields to understand, you know, the what the ACL joint is composed of. All of these components are there. I, what I look to is to say, how can I make the situation easier for people? So for the for the devil's advocate question to get back to it I think that when people are living within with lots of trauma and conflict in their personal life if other people are forcing them 
they will probably have the desire to force other people because it will be a way to to psychologically consider themselves re-empowering. They want to be on the other side of the gun. Mm. If people are having voluntary interactions and enjoying the sweetness of that life, they're probably going to want to avoid coercive situations. Mm -hmm. What I look to do is to isolate whether a person is having a hard time in conflict, and if so, to let them give a voice to it. I don't want to try to convince people to adopt voluntarism. I want to try to help people. And I try to figure out how can I do that by understanding what are they looking for. So every time I talk with someone, I just I try to understand what are my motives in talking with them and what could be their motives in talking with me. So I've, I've kind of given up on convincing people. And uh, that's I found that that was really, really helpful in, in making for productive conversation. Yeah, I agree. I take a similar approach I, uh, when people tell me that, you know, what are you going to do in this situation? What if, um, you know, a dark alley and uh, there's a guy with a gun and there's no police because you're a stateless utopia? What are you going to do then? <laughs> and uh, it's funny yeah. because, um, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend to have all the answers to every hypothetical rabbit hole that that person might come up with you know um and i think the first person that does pretend that um you got a question you gotta be skeptical uh, because the idea is not to have a ready-made solution for every situ for every problem um you know if a problem comes up you deal with it right but i think um what's more important is the way you said is to bring the question back to the individual and say, well, forget about everyone else, right? We can't control everyone else, but you can control yourself, right? So do you use violence to solve problems in your daily life? No. Do you use other people? Do you, do you advocate for other people to use violence to solve your problems? No. <laughs> so there, we established a basic um, understanding of morality and what your moral code is. I think that's good. I, I think you're a good person. <laughs> now, if you can, if you if you become consistent with that, you're not going to delegate um, a right that you don't have to a politician <laughs> to do uh, of the very same um, you know destructive behavior that you're recommending right to other people. So so you just have to be logically consistent. And also another thing is that people are afraid. You know, they're afraid of all these things. You know, what if what happened? What if this might happen? What if this might happen? And then you know what? Sometimes you have to live with the uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't have every, every solution, every problem. <laughs> you know? And some people are afraid of that, I guess. You know, it seems they genuinely fear it. So and and since since for me embracing volunteerism, I have lost that fear of the unknown of what might happen if you know if these people come into the geographical region known as the u.s what might happen right so what therefore we should use violence to prevent them to come in like what <laughs> you know so i have lost that fear i've lost that fear too my concerns are extremely focused locally and personally especially personally mm -hmm. i'm the one to lift my life up and to to make sure that I I shoot high, I aim high so at least I can get somewhere instead of staying complacent mm -hmm. with a day-to-day -day grind. I, I am the one to lift my own life up. As soon as I have that edge of the edge between me and another person and interacting with them, I try to understand what is their perspective, where are they coming from? As I like, I'm we're like you and I in our several, you know, couple conversations so far, we're coming to that edge of finding out what is your perspective? Where is Danilo coming from here? Mm -hmm. And and you're like, where is Daryl coming from here? And I'm like, well, you, you know, just like you, dude, I've got all these resources. You can look me up. <laughs> you can see where I'm coming from. But that takes time. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. And most people, you can't look them up. They don't have a social media. Of history or portfolio that you can dive through, mm -hmm. but I can I can make it faster and like just go back through that example you brought up of the person who fantasizes that they're going to delegate authority to a politician, and to me that's no different than fantasizing a win attributed to the Red Sox or the Yankees. <laughs> you know, for them to feel awesome about that win that in no way did they participate in. Mm. I mean, likely, you know. Um, that is just something that's really important. Like, are they, do they live in a fantasy? Because voting is a fantasy, in my opinion, like statistically and then gerrymandering wise. And then further going a further step, I don't trust the vote counting process. Um, if they believe in that process, that's one thing. That's like people who believe that vaccines 
are verified to have eliminated and reduced diseases and have been proven to be safe. I, I like to go both ways. I don't believe or disbelieve those claims. I have a speculation and I, I a suspicion. And for action purposes, I make an action choice. So in the case of voting and politicians, my speculation and strong conclusion for a use of, you know, the purpose of making action choices is my vote does not in any way change the outcome of those people at all, mm -hmm. even slightly, is not counted accurately. And the whole scene, politician-wise, is gangsterville in a big way, is like a huge gangster-oriented kind of thing of things being paid for behind the scenes. And the same thing goes on in the medical industry, the people who made the vaccines. I don't trust them. In the same way, because I'd be foolish to do so, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> their track record is abysmal, medically speaking. Um, death by medicine. Put that in your search engine and look up that one. Like mm -hmm. how many people die yearly from medical procedures and medicine? That's just that's the reported numbers. Right. And it's considerable. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Not so much in our field. You know, in our field, we're like the opposite. We're like, they're making clients for us. They're totally, <laughs> totally effing up all these people to the point where at a certain point they, ha they are messed up, but they have money and they come to us and we're there to pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's just an example of, of one situation. So whenever I talk to a person, I try to understand how firm and fixed is their attitude and their conclusions and their beliefs? If they're really firm on that, in other words, if they base their self-esteem on being correct about their conclusions because to, to actually acknowledge that they were incorrect would be to swallow a huge piece of sadness and frustration and shame for having probably, if they start connecting the dots, created a lot of tragedies in their life and maybe others. Like if they accepted that maybe they got it wrong about vaccines, then they would accept that they gave th those to their child. They are culpable for that decision. So to research that after having made that decision, it's the same kind of thing. And if you're old and you were basing your whole life based upon believing and voting in politicians and it's kind of like Charlie Brown and Lucy pulling back this football, you know, <laughs> it's like this time for sure, you know, and like how many times do you fly in the air and land on your back before you just know that you're not playing a good game? So when I talk to people, I try to understand where are they coming from attitude wise? Um, if they base their self-esteem on having the correct conclusion, what I call an addiction to certainty. I I keep that in mind and I don't want to like I don't want to think ill of them. I want to be supportive of people when I interact with them in general. But I do want to find out what makes them tick. I want to understand where they're coming from. And if if it's useful, I'll try to help them understand where I'm coming from. I'll try to demonstrate flexibility and humility. Because indeed, like with the things such as politics and vaccines, I could be getting it wrong. I don't have a billion dollar Daryl Institute to verify all of my facts, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> I don't have secret agents who can go out and get me the real skinny on what's going down out there. Mm -hmm. All I have is what the same as what you have, Danilo. I, I search engine things. I compare sources. I compare notes. And apparently you and I have come to some pretty similar conclusions. <laughs> oh, yeah, apparently so. Um, so I want to get into your website. But I just want to say one more thing on this topic real quick is that um, when I talk to people about Chinese medicine, um, and they are skeptical of it. I say, do you know what iatrogenic illnesses are? <laughs> yeah, like I said, <laughs> you Google know? death by medicine. Yeah, and most people don't. You I'm know? like, yeah, I'm like, that's it's physician induced illness. Isn't that an amazing thing? You go to a physician because you have a problem, and he gives you a problem, <laughs> and uh, and then you look up, yeah, death by medicine, iatrogenic deaths, and it's like, what is it like third? leading cause of death third or fourth something like that you know up there with heart attack and stroke and car accidents um and uh, and it's amazing you know properly prescribed um you know prescription medication taken as directed um killing people you know fda approved completely legal and <laughs> everything <laughs> everything is legitimate 
killing people and uh, and then they they are afraid of things like 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 vitamins and uh and uh chinese herbs and acupuncture <laughs> so the fear is so misguided it's kind of uh it's kind of funny so <laughs> i just thought well, I'd... i would say close to one out of three people when i talk to them i mean unless they're very young or extremely old they know someone who's had acupuncture or they themselves have had acupuncture. And by and large, more and more people know that your back pain is not getting fixed up by your MD doctor, but it sure is with an acupuncturist mm -hmm. in fairly good time. Some of some people out there, their insurance is covering it. I certainly have a lot of colleagues right now who take insurance money for that. Um, I am on the fence on that one, meaning that I like the money idea. Right. But the paperwork of it is substantial oh, yeah. and the buy-in is substantial too um what i do think is that uh when people have a medical situation that's serious for themselves or someone they love it's the worst time for them to do research on the subject exactly because they're yeah. so tense about it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they um are quick to dismiss sources of information it's again why i go back to having an explainable method of critical thinking mm. The Trivium method is the one that I, I promote and use as, I mean, I would have to say the Trivium method can lead you to a lot of different things, specifically grammar, knowing your definitions, doing research on the actual components, logic, understanding the connections between those individual components, and also knowing logical fallacy. It's like the appeal to authority and the hasty generalization fallacy, all doctors are this, all acupuncturists are this, etc. Mm -hmm. That's very hasty and quick. Mm -hmm. And you flag those things as possibly erroneous conclusions. And you just try to understand real connections. And then from there, it's the practical applications of the first two, the practical applications of putting together knowledge of the components, a full definition for each term, and the connections between them, how it works, how it kind of works, how it absolutely does not work. Kind of like if you and I were to talk about a treatment um, procedure and both of us would know that there's like a variety of ways that the same treatment could go and deliver the same like excellent results. But there would be a couple ways that we could both describe that would not help the person, you know, or that would be in danger of hurting the person. Mm -hmm. And we would be able to describe this to a student of ours if we were, you know, here to help someone learn acupuncture and oriental medicine. We'd be able to help them understand, here's what would probably work, here's what would sort of work, here's what would not work at all, probably. And there's a reason for that is because we both have the knowledge and understanding and practical applications, which is, a, you know, that's explicit critical thinking. And a lot of people out there, if you ask them what's their method of critical thinking, they probably can't have, they don't have a method that they can explain. It's not methodological. It's intuitive. And it's only as good as their intuition is. That's a problem. So I went, there's also this statement I've heard too many people say, you need to get out of your head. You need to get into your heart and feel your feelings more. You know, <laughs> I've heard that said to me and other people many times. <laughs> what I see it as is people are often not using their head correctly. So it's like a hamster going around the same ground over and over again in a wheel instead of covering the subjects methodologically and deliberately achieving a predicted and desired result. That's the way the brain and thinking and intellectualism is meant to be done, in my opinion. And at the same time, there's the emotions. And there are ways to have a balanced approach to, to dealing with them as, as sensors for what's going on. And I like to use nonviolent communication for that, to, to know how I observe things, to see the feelings I'm having, to know the qualities that motivate both thoughts and feelings, and to take an action or strategy that's going to get what I want. And that's nonviolent communication in a nutshell. I just described it, you know, for anyone who studies that. But, but for, for you, Danilo, you know, that's, that could sound really nice and abstract. It sounds like, you know, can you give me a practical application of that? You know? <laughs> um, it, what I'm trying to say is um, there are a lot of people out there who are confused and the best time to study a medical issue or anything that could be very volatile would be when you don't have an emergency. But when, when people are having an emergency, it's often that's where I see their skill level go down. It would be like the worst time to learn martial arts is when you're being mugged <laughs> right then and there. 
right, you know exactly you, you wouldn't do it then you'd be practicing for months and months and months ahead of time mm-hmm. it's this you know there are a lot of ways to to do this and and of course like i would often mention de-escalation methods mm. where you use your mind and you use your heart you balance yourself internally and you find what motivates the other person so you can get to a result that you want which hopefully is nonviolent yeah that was me plugging some of the methods that i like to use yeah yeah you actually just des- described uh, you reminded me of um dale brown the viper threat management center i yeah. interviewed him um uh maybe like a few months ago awesome interview awesome guy and uh, he talked a lot about de-escalation of violent potentially violent situations and how successful he is with that and how much better he's getting at it um with with even like without even having guns on him or his employees person um and so he's getting so good so basically they rely on yeah how do you talk to people you know you know how do you relate to them you know using psychology to diffuse a very tense situation and uh and he really does a great job with that um whereas you know <laughs> most law enforcement is like shoot first ask questions later <laughs> i felt threatened <laughs> you know i thought he had a gun so <laughs> a little bit, you little know, bit different <laughs> i'm hoping that just like torrents spelled the death of blockbuster video yeah and uh hopefully will spell the death of pretty much all all services until like netflix is forced to stream their stuff for 30 cents a yeah. month you know <laughs> yeah. um basically because they can't compete you know otherwise than that because people will just go to a site and grab the whole file right. a good quality file for free yeah um in the same way i'm hoping that folks like dale and threat management companies sprout up all over the place making police and military completely obsolete mm-hmm. and in the end of it all i mean it's a very big juggernaut of the systems of coercion and control, coercive collectivism that is called monopoly governments. The, what is it, 193 different monopoly governments covering this globe right now, something like that. And that's a system right there where you, you occasionally will hear that nasty phrase, well, if you don't like it, you can just leave to <laughs> one of those other ones. You know, it's, right. it, it's, yeah. Uh, very much, um, yeah, you, you out there listening, you can put in your search engine the Jones Plantation, the Larkin Rose video on right. YouTube. Yeah, it's awesome. And you can get a, a, great little, a great little colorful example of the, the trouble that I'm speaking of. The only way I know of to get rid of a coercive, nasty situation that's a monopoly is to produce pluralities that are powerful. Mm-hmm. What I'm hoping is more and more practitioners like you and me will be out there. Like what I want to do is train more practitioners in the future. I want two practitioners in every home minimum. Hmm. And I want that because who else are you going to look to to get things done at 1.30 in the morning when you have a medical problem? Right. Now, there will always be a need for obviously like highly equipped hospitals and highly proficient practitioners like you and me to do things that the average person can't do yet but what i'm hoping is more and more technology like fills in the gap you know because mm-hmm. there's some um are you familiar with electromedicine you know for example royal raymond rife and uh and his technology and and things that happened uh, a century ago i heard a little bit about him uh not too much though yeah so there there were a lot of pioneers uh back 100 years ago and then some who were developing systems of what I would call uh, electromedicine, hmm. basically. They were using radio frequencies like Rife does. They were using all types of methodologies, uh, including you know other frequency generators and lasers and things as they eventually became uh, developed over years to treat situations in a really more profound and effective way. So quietly behind the scenes, a lot of medicine has been de- being developed and when certain practitioners holding certain licenses use something like a Rife machine, they can become quickly under attack if it's become widely known that they're effectively using it to treat a condition such as cancer, for example. Mm-hmm. Whereas other medical practitioners, um, if they're on the down low, they can certainly get away with it. Um, for people who sell the equipment, 
they can get away with it as long as they're not actually using the equipment for treating wise for people who are, uh, you know, basically not having any license at all. They don't have any skin in the game mm -hmm. except for they could get in trouble for practicing medicine without a license. So there's been a concerted attack on effective medicine for a long time. It is lucky that our license and our field is not under the same type of attack lens right now. We're part of what's called complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM. You know, in other words, we're often we are like the little lackeys who are called in to help treat a client's nasty nausea symptoms that are going along with their chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. We're called in to help with like to to do some cleanup mm -hmm. of like a small remedial, like remedying type fashion for for some people, people like us. What I'm looking for and I'm calling for is more people to understand that they have the power to learn to do what we do. Like I'm pretty sure like the base of what you and I learned both in college and then in clinic can be, you know, begun and, and finished in maybe like 250, 300 hours. Hmm. The base of how to treat safely and effectively and then, you know, continue learning from there. Hmm. The base of it. So if it's only 300 hours, Danilo... What the hell were we doing in school for so long? <laughs> well, we were feeding a beast that was, you know, there to, you know, it was a regulatory capture thing. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what it was. It was nothing more than that, you know. And there's a lot of cry for, oh, it's for the safety of our clients, you know. You know, we need to, they need to know that we're clever and we can spit things back on paper really well, you know, even though that's not what we do in clinic. They have to justify, you know? they have to justify their federal grants and uh, financial aid. <laughs> That's it. That's money. it. And if you happen to have been taking, you know, federal aid and you're happen to be an acupuncturist listening to this and you, you're still paying off your debt uh, for your schooling, I totally get you and I understand. And I also doubt that you're one of the people listening to this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'd love to find out if there is one. And yeah, my, that's that would be my opinion of it. Um, it is a lot of justification game. It's that type of thing I mentioned earlier. The compulsion to feel really certain about your conclusions instead of to put a question mark at the end of the statement and say, I wonder, what if this was done for the sole purpose of manipulating a certain behavior that's very profitable to a certain minority? You know? Mm -hmm. um, those are my thoughts on that. You know, I can see um, very easily how people can look at the idea of licenses and say, "Well, those are good. How can you, how can you hate licenses? I mean, how else are we going to tell the good practitioners from the bad practitioners? Right? These are the people that really stuck it out and went through, you know, two thousand hours, whatever was necessary, and they studied really hard. So they must be the best of the best. How could you be against licenses, Daryl?" <laughs> <laughs> and you know so you almost have the answer to that right i mean you yeah, know yeah, I, I like playing devil's advocate <laughs> okay well my answer to that one and i want to hear your answer to sure, it too sure, sure. Uh, my answer is i've seen it twice now i've i've gone through oriental medical college twice so i got to see colleagues go through and get their boards and i got to see them struggle the ones who are really good at tests not so great in clinic mm. i got to see that and I did see a few who were good at both and that they just happened to multitask in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I saw some really, really good practitioners, Danilo, and they could not pass their board exams. Yeah, yeah. Twice. Mm -hmm. And once they got that far, they didn't want to risk the next three times because it's expensive to try each time. It's right. very expensive to take your board exams. Right. These people, I saw them in clinic. I worked with them. They were very proficient, but they are horrible test takers and horrible memorizers. That's mm -hmm. not what their skill is. Their skill is to help people. Mm -hmm. So what it does, what licensing does, is it artificially reduces, it creates artificial scarcity. It reduces mm -hmm. the number of available practitioners. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing for every single market. It's the same thing for all the people who are great at building houses and repairing houses. A contractor license is a procedure. It takes time. It costs money. It's not as bad as our board exams, but it still takes time and costs money. And so it artificially reduces the number of practitioners that you can go out there to hire. So that's what the purpose of licenses are for. Like the old saying, licenses are a monopoly government 
coercively removing your legal ability to do what you know how to do and selling it back to you yeah <laughs> basically and that's basically it you know exactly. like oh you know how to fish well here why don't you pay for the ability to fish you know how to do this <laughs> well let's have you pay to do this it's a lack of trust it's again it's that external motivations that were taught in school and uh and with that i'm hoping at some point it transitions over We'll transition to the peaceful parenting, but how would you answer that devil's advocate about license? Um, well, well, the way, um, yeah. So, that, yeah, that's that's also the, the route I would go. With the, uh, it creates artificial scarcity, it erects huge barriers to entry for other people. You know, maybe with the uh, without the resources, um, and they can't enter the field as a result. Um, I guess in in a very similar way, like um, a lot of uh, protectionist laws, and you know, all these. Um, um, complex regulations that small businesses have to comply with. So many of them, as a result, never get off the ground. Um, and pretty much very similar. And uh, like minimum minimum wage too. If uh, if you know if it gets if a business is not profitable enough to to pay their workers minimum wage, you know they can't they can't do that. And so so this is like this is like um, minimum wage for practitioners or, or, or let's say for acupuncturists, um, where you know if you don't have the the necessary capital to you know get over that hurdle you're just never going to make it right the, the 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 state just cuts off the bottom rungs of the ladder <laughs> and uh and uh, it, it just makes yeah, people and um, it's about that simple it makes people um a certain portion of the population unemployable as a result because you know because they don't have a license right so um and, and, and the other thing is like like you said um uh, giving giving people the ability to enter any field is a wonderful thing, right? Because of course the market will figure out, you know, people will figure out by trying all these people, regardless of if they have a license or not, you know, people are going to try everybody and then, you know, you're going to, people are probably going to rate them on Yelp and, you know, different places on, on, uh, on the internet. And, and of course you're going to figure out the, the cra the cranks and the quacks from the real <laughs> practitioners. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm definitely not fearful about that. So it's it's like if you if you need to seek validation for yourself by getting a license, then what does that say about your skills? <laughs> yeah, and I understand that right now the apprenticeship field, like which is the way I started, right. that of being invited by a practitioner to work for them and learn what they do, right. is an extremely limited hangout that is hugely under attack by all these regulating agencies. They hate when people are just teaching other people without being regulated and without making unnecessary hoops to jump through. Those are people in the regulatory field. They love to make unnecessary hoops for people to jump through, mm -hmm. which, again, you know, for every hoop that they erect, there's some money and cha-ching yeah. each time. Right. You know? So there's an economic incentive for the monopolies to perpetuate themselves, mm -hmm. and there is an economic incentive for the individual to disassociate from that and for people like us to give needles to our clients, show them how to needle themselves, <laughs> give them tools, give them moxa. Herbs right. take more time and give them the wisdom to understand the needles, very safe by and large when you follow the certain rules. Mm -hmm. When, when uh, using herbal medicine, and I'm certainly a proponent for testing in you know bioenergetic forms of testing to to get a, an idea and a feel for how something is going to interact biochemically and bioenergetically and structurally for a person before they even ingest it and this is uh, something that of course you know people can look up as both applied and clinical kinesiology and people can consider that uh, you know, if you go to a website like Quackbusters and you know Skeptic Raptor, you can see all the the logical fallacies that are written on these subjects. But again, like you mentioned, people go to practitioners, and they're going to correlate the results that they get from their practitioners. Mm -hmm. And if the results are stellar or just plain old pretty good, then they're going to refer out, and people are going to trust them. And that's the portfolio of trust that I'm looking for. I want a portfolio of trusted, happy clients and practitioners and a network between both of them. I want everyone being all nice and plugged in and connected. And I want everyone to disconnect from looking for and paying for licenses. Like if every single license holder 
of all kinds just suddenly decided to stop feeding that system, and we're going to practice anyway. F you. Mm-hmm. We're practicing anyway. I'm not renewing my license next year. Mm-hmm. That would be something, huh? Like, oh, we're all going to, we've all decided to unplug. We don't need to pay every year. We don't need to pay every two years. We don't need your system anymore. You can, you can go sit and spin, and you know which finger I'm holding up, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and that is, um, you know, that, that is basically all the old people who luckily are soon going to die. They're the ones who trust licenses. The young people are thinking and researching stuff. The young people are listening to the podcast like this. Young people are considering their options. Like, oh, young person listening, you're 20-something. You don't need to go through fifty, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 of debt to be an acupuncturist if you can simply learn to use lasers, magnets, and frequency machinery on the acupuncture points. No license needed. Treat yourself, your family, and maybe even go fully into business as an herbalist using those tools as well. Mm-hmm. You don't need to go through that debt. You don't need to go through that training. <laughs> All these people out there can be like, oh, that's an option. Oh, hmm. you know. Yeah. Or you could choose to go through it if you have the money, I understand. And there are some beautiful teachers in acupuncture colleges out there. But what I would encourage is more of an unplugging and um, more of a plurality to be put forward. Mm. So that more people could just stop thinking the same thoughts that the old people who are soon to die and go away are thinking (laughs) and start thinking new thoughts. Add the question mark to the end of the sentence. How can you learn to do what we do? How can you learn to do better than what we do and treat the health of yourself and your family? I want to just put that question into this discussion. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really, really great. That's so true. And and the one thing I'm I just thought of was that I'm sure there are a lot of practitioners who you know went through all that schooling and and spent all that money and passed their boards, and then and then if they come up uh, if somebody who wants to learn what they learn just by apprenticing under them, uh, ask them to do that. They would say, no, go through what I went through because I went through that and you have to go through the same thing, uh, which is very sad, you know, if if that were to happen because it just, like you said, perpetuates this system that, uh, you know, is uh, immoral and is robbing everybody. So, um, yeah. We that need... sounds like an old person. Yeah, That's most That's an likely. old way of thinking. Probably. You know, old of mind or old of body or both. You right, know? right. And I understand that. And, you know, I have to say this. I mean, I... I like people, old and young. I don't like old thinking. And I am glad that by and large, the young people that I've met and spent time with, they are not thinking like that. Mm. By and large, they're questioning more. They are extremely critical, skeptical, and, and very questioning, very humble. Mm. They have flexibility. They have optimism. They might not know what their trajectory of their life is, but they they know they've got a little more time to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And old people, like like you described with a practitioner who's not willing to apprentice someone and wants someone else to go through the hard times that they went through, well, that's a person who's pretty out of touch with their own feelings. Because if you went through something like a concentration camp to you know <laughs> be able to get to own your house in France – why would you ever want someone else to go through a concentration camp? <laughs> you right. have to be pretty disturbed to do that, you know? Right. So I would, I would, this is why I like, I, I look towards promoting methods that are done alone and one on one and in groups to learn to honor the feelings that are going on and what motivated those feelings, like a feeling of frustration at the thought of a, an up-and-coming practitioner who avoided the hardships that you personally had to endure mm. and understand what motivated that and which is that you you feel sad that you went through that crap mm. and you feel frustrated and maybe even ashamed of that you didn't find an easier way to get there, you know. And then you could feel fearful that what if this new person takes your clients as if you own your clients, you know. <laughs> not, not understanding ownership again, you know. <laughs> you stole my client. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You didn't own your client in the first place. This is <laughs> we're not in slavery, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, people choose who they choose, and um, 
It's like dating, you know. Right. You stole my boyfriend. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so before yeah. we go, uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but before we go, please talk a little bit about your, um, you know, your approach to relationships and peaceful parenting, and I assume that that relates to nonviolent communication as well. Yeah. Um. So I like to. I do a lot of work regarding the Mankind Project, which is some men's groups that sit in circle, people who like work to gain greater emotional literacy and knowledge of the feelings going on and greater knowledge of the stories that everyone – that uh, certainly I gain greater knowledge of the stories I tell myself about myself and other people in the world and find ways to change those stories. I mean things that go way back that – have often been the cause of horrible trauma in my relationships of the past and problems even with me and my daughter and with me and other people. Uh, those are component usages. You can look up the Mankind Project and uh, Wikipedia and other places and understand what I mean by that. I also sit in men and women's groups, which utilize similar methods so that, you know, in a co-gender kind of way, you know, coming to these things. I studied with Katie Testa, who you had on your show when, when we were in the Google Plus Hangout together. We both were training on our own and come together weekly hmm. using nonviolent communication methods, though at the same time, I was also using the trivia method of critical thinking as in the way that I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, I was finding that there were problems the way certain people applied nonviolent communication. If you've heard people use it and it sounds very scripty or like that there are certain jargon terms that are being used, um, you, I mean, you, the listener out there, if you know someone who uses nonviolent communication, you might know of some people out there who have it expressed in a certain way that like, oh, I see you're feeling this. Is that because you're needing this? That type of thing. And... I make very sure to train with nonviolent communication in such a way as I'm using it, but in no way can you tell that I'm using it mm. because I'm using it for myself and I'm not trying to make a bridge with it necessarily right away. A uh, bridge of empathy of uh, basically making a bridge is afterwards. So I found that that was a really useful tool internally, just like training martial arts is really useful to be healthy internally. Mm -hmm. The other approach interpersonally, just like with the martial arts, is very, very useful because you can be able to, once you calm yourself down, you can understand what motivates someone with asking a few questions. And you can also become a, a far more connected person to other people by active listening, by responding or speaking to what the other person says, what's their observation, speaking to the other person's motivational factors that, that are called needs in NVC jargon, unfortunately. Um, they call those motivational qualities needs, which is very confusing to anyone who doesn't study NVC, by the way. In fact, it's really confusing to people who don't study NVC. But if you and I did study NVC, I would say the word needs, just like with you and I studying acupuncture, I, I, I could, you know, very simply describe Xiaoyuan, and, you know, yeah. liver chi stagnation. Mm -hmm. And I, I could go right there. So I could speak to a person's strategies and actions. There, there are ways to use these tools to promote, um, to promote good relationships in general. I think that peaceful parenting, Danilo, I mean, I wanted, to, I wanted to hear your take on this because from my perspective, a lot of people have uh, different ideas as if they can um, define it. In the same way as when people hear the word nonviolent communication, they think they can define what the methodology is without having looked it up. And, and a lot of people define peaceful parenting in what is actually permissive parenting, which is not the same thing. Um, I kind of forfeited most of my parenting about eight years ago when I moved here, um, unfortunately. And that's a huge sadness for me when I bring it up. Um, you are in the midst of active parenting. Your little ones are, I don't know, possibly asleep by now. Uh, <laughs> uh, should um, be. They should be, <laughs> but most yeah. likely not. <laughs> so okay, well they're they're getting there. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you're you're with your little ones, and you have a real relationship with them and and with your partner. Um, 
I'm curious to, to hear your your solid you know description and definition of peaceful parenting. Yeah, so um, you know, I uh, I am involved with a lot of uh, homeschooling families, and so um, a lot of them are, you know, amenable to these ideas of peaceful parenting, um, you know, and, and unschooling. So I talk to them, and, and also on my channel, actually, I do a lot of focusing on um, people who practice peaceful parenting, unschooling, and homeschooling as a way. Uh, to create a better world, and then as a way to um, eradicate the uh, this this mental idea of statism or the belief in authority, because um, you know statism starts at home. You know, um, the kids they um, they become us. Whatever we are, they become right. And so, if we act from a from a a place of authority where we could do no wrong you know where we can you know um mete out punishment violently and we can't ourselves you know be punished for what we do um or we can't be judged in the same vein as they can because they are fundamentally inferior um you know that's not logically consistent so yeah so that's that's kind of the way i describe peaceful parenting is um you know in general, I say parent the way you want to see the world uh, that they will grow up in. You know, how do you want to see the future? That's how you parent your children. Um, but also, more specifically, it's um, I say that uh, you know already we are um, superior to our children in that we are bigger, older, stronger, and more experienced in life. And so we already have this power differential that's um, inherent in the relationship. And so. What I try to do is to nullify as much as possible that differential because to emphasize that differential through use of uh, of punishments and violence and yelling um, is is cowardly. <laughs> you know, it's just it's really uh, really pretty absurd because you know why do you need to have to 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 have to emphasize that that's that's just the epitome of cowardice you know um these people are they or, or these these children they're they're young they're small they're inexperienced they're weak you know they're young so they have so many uh disadvantages from our perspective so the way i look at it, i try to nullify all of those as much as possible talk to them um on equal terms as much as possible, you know, I try to be there, you know, I say, I want to be their friend or their peer, or, or um, if there's any power differential, uh, you know, I say, okay, I'll be, I, I would like to be your advisor, right? And to give you advice um, and that you will follow my advice, not because you have to or else you're going to get punished, but because you want to, because you see that my advice, advice is valuable um, because you have followed it in the past, right? And to allow children to make mistakes uh, because that's how we all learn, right? Um, that's the best way to learn is, is, is trial and error. And so um, I definitely, uh, which is why we're always out in the woods and camping and hiking and doing, you know, making fire and catching frogs and <laughs> doing all kinds of fun stuff in the woods. And uh, and one thing that I um, I really uh, got to appreciate is, is this one homeschooling family. Her kids, you know, they're like seven, six, and two. And her kids are pretty proficient with knives. And she's Russian. It's a Russian family. And so that's one thing I learned from her is... is is uh, to be more comfortable around knives and children, you know, which which is uh, which is shocking to most parents of kids that age, you know, six and five year olds like that. Um, but it's amazing, you know, when when you really trust your children with things, um, they um, they feel that right, and and they they see that you trust them, and uh, and then they they're not. You know, they don't act like children anymore, really. <laughs> you know, they they get pretty mature pretty quickly. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. So that's kind of that's kind of my approach. Is um, you know, I'd like I like them to follow my advice because they want to, not because they have to, right? And uh, and I'm not to say you know I, I emphasize too. I'm not to say I'm a perfect parent because you know a lot of times I see myself, uh, I see my father in me in my parenting, and. Um, and I try to catch myself, you know, raising your voice. Um, I mean, I don't hit my kids, but just raising the voice and just getting angry. And I'm like, okay, I have to calm down, take a deep breath and, you know, relax. And let's talk about this. And why did you do that? You know, try to reason with your kids as much as possible. Um, and that that's another interesting thing is uh, when I see some parents 
talking to their kids, you know, explaining in, in pretty intricate detail to, let's say, I don't know, four-year-old, five-year-old. Um, and then people come over and say, why are you doing that? They don't understand reason. Why are you, why are you talking to them like that? You're just wasting your time. <laughs> and so what I like to tell those people is that, you know, when our children were born, they didn't understand English, right? But we still spoke to them in English, right? And eventually, <laughs> they learned English, right? Because we were, we were surrounded by people speaking in English. So if you don't reason with your kids because you don't believe they understand how to reason, how do you expect them to reason or to learn how to reason? <laughs> That's how they learn is by, wow. is, is by you modeling such behavior. So there, it, it is no excuse not to do something just because they haven't, uh, but just because they can't understand you, right? They will come to that point. You keep doing that. So, um, so yeah, it's so important for people to not only talk to your kids, but talk in a calm tone and get down to their level. Not like standing over them and towering, but, you know, get kneel down, get down to their level. I think that's so important uh, to really... Um, hear what they have to say and to respect it. And, and also one more thing I'll say is that as a child for me, I remember feeling the idea that, um, you know, I'm just a child. What use can I have to my parents? How can I possibly um, say something that they would value, you know, in their lives and find useful? You know, I felt like I was impotent. Like I, I couldn't say anything that they would find useful. I, I hated that feeling. And then finally, one day when I did tell them, something that I found useful. I remember that like, wow, they took my advice and that's, it's such a good feeling. So that's why I think it's so important to listen to our kids and what they have to say and, and really take it seriously. You know, it's not just a kid talking, it's a person, it's a human being, you know? So that's my approach. Beautiful. And, <laughs> and so you have a, a group of other parents who also use these methods for their children that, and you're friends with all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to varying degrees, they use these methods. Um, I think I I can explain it <laughs> a little more uh, with a little more clarity and lucidness than they can. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we're pretty um, a pretty good bunch of people. We're very tolerant, and uh, you know, we just came back from a camping trip, and my my brother, my twenty four year old brother, went went with us, and uh, I was he was talking to me about the trip, and and one thing that he he said was he he was really amazed and shocked. At the at the level of maturity and tolerance out of all of us, because you know we're all different. You know we all parent our kids slightly different ways, but it doesn't matter. You know you're tolerant of other people and how they do things, and that's the whole idea. Is is um, you know I, I hate it when homeschooling families who are inherently different, like people you know people choose to homeschool because they're critical of the one size fits all government school uh, si uh, system. And so they do things differently. And then what's funny is that when, when homeschooling parents get together and they criticize each other for the way the other person homeschools, I'm like, that's the whole idea. Everybody does it their own way. <laughs> it's not going to be the same thing. And that's a beautiful thing. I love, I love that everybody does it their own way. And uh, so I kind of, I kind of uh, point that out to them sometimes. I'm like, why are, we, why, are we, why are you criticizing other people? This is the whole idea is you get to do it your way. And, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. So... So yeah, so it's a yeah. great, great bunch of people. There's that addiction to certainty, that desire to be really certain, to be fixed in your conclusion. Yeah, you saw it right there, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's an attitude assessment. Like I find that that's been over this last year, it's been like one of my one of my favorite tools to assess attitudes and going on like that. Because when I see that, I can I can find a way to connect with them internally at first, just to like recognize. They have a strong conclusion and they're attached to it. And, and that's really important because these are the parents of the children who my child was friends with. This was back when I, you know, when I lived in Vermont, when I was taking my child to other parents. Mm -hmm. I was starting to do that internally without knowing what I was doing. I did read The Continuum Concept by Jean Leadloft and uh, that book was my eye opener before my daughter was born to help me understand what was wrong with way parenting goes on in the Western world and potentially what are ways that could le lead to a more happy childhood. And that does include the child does get to play with knives and does get to have danger and mm -hmm. does get to experiment. Mm -hmm. And so I got to see that with parenting with my daughter playing up on the roof and, you know, it was a flat enough roof in various parts. Mm. There's certainly danger. And 
she and her friends loved to go up on the roof, and mm-hmm. some of the parents of these children hated it when I would let them all play right. up on the roof. Yeah. And <laughs> no one ever got hurt on the roof because children don't want to get hurt, by and large, right. you know. Right. And and there there are a lot, a lot of varieties of um, of elements of pushing the envelope for courage, um, similar to. You know, all of this, this is a kind of important. It's not perfect parenting. It's peaceful parenting. And, right. <laughs> you know, the the only reason that it's a phrase is because alliteration is pretty sexy to most people. Hmm. Everyone loves alliteration. Hmm. And I think that what you were describing was like emulating a behavior to the children. They can express their frustration and anger. They're learning to understand where their emotions come from and that could take a little time to help them fully get a grasp on that Mm. um if you don't personally have a grasp on what motivates your own feelings emotionally speaking how could you possibly emulate it to them and show them control that would be a question you know and and of course you know with skill you learn to do that and learn you learn how to communicate you learn how to set boundaries for yourself and to certainly help them set their own boundaries so that they can make their own area where they have control. So when I was parenting, my daughter had control of her room. So it was a mess because that's how she wanted to do it. So I let her do that right. for years. At this point in her life, she no longer does that. She's, mm-hmm. you know, that was back then when she was a little kid. Mm-hmm. She experimented with that for years. Now she doesn't want to live in a mess because you know she she uh, experiences that. Right. Setting boundaries for yourself and helping to show a child how to set boundaries for themselves is a way to preserve harmony. With boundaries that are mutually known and understood and respected, you have no conflict. Like who owns your feelings, Danilo? Who is causing you to be pleased or angry about this specific podcast that you're making? And if you took 100% responsibility for your own feelings, just for now, at least intellectually speaking, you just understood that external events happen and you interpret those events and that inspires your feelings. And what are you personally going to do about it is 100% in your control because you're not in a prison cell. You're able to create things like that. Well, that type of thinking and that type of dealing with your emotions as a real adult is something you can emulate to children. And what I would certainly encourage the listeners out there who do have children is to respect that their children are just barely learning to, you know, experience and recognize and fully flower out with all of their feelings. They're the ones that I would wish to give greater latitude and that they have obviously less control over that aspect of their life. We are the ones who have the capacity to demonstrate that we have control over that, not repressed control. There's times to demonstrate anger and frustration, but to show that you have control is a really excellent thing to emulate, that, that you, you know, when troubles arise, that you're the cool cucumber, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, right. And that when, when there is a boundary problem and a conflict, that you have communication skills to find out who owns what. There are many parenting styles to help with that, I think. The parent effectiveness training is one of those things. I don't specifically subscribe to that one. I'm I'm a lot more of using the tools that you've heard me already describe in this show. Mm-hmm. But just to, to understand that children are born into a form of captivity. Mm-hmm. In other words, they have less capacity. They can't just suddenly run off, get a job, get an apartment – Get a car. There's all these barriers to entry for them mm-hmm. in such a big way. Barriers to exit. And, <laughs> yeah, and there's so that for them it's essentially a barriers to exit. Yeah. So they're in a form of captivity. <laughs> right, right. And it's it's an opportunity as a parent to help them go from that captivity to freedom. Mm. And if it's in a smooth, effective transition from child to adult and there's no need for any in-between time, that transition could happen for anywhere between age 12 to 18. I don't even know when. There's no specific age. It's about when do they acquire the internal skills to manage themselves and the external skills to manage the world. Hmm. And it's an opportunity as a parent to help them, to demonstrate a life that makes sense for you, and then to help them find a trajectory and a life that makes sense for them. I wanted to put that one out there 
Yeah, yeah, great. You, you mean you brought up so many great points. This this can be a show in itself, <laughs> peaceful parenting. Um, but uh, let me just say real quick uh, before we go that uh, you remind me of a, a few points, um, and one of them is, you know, you, when you say emulate um, certain actions, uh, I, one thing I like to tell people is that you know, be the parent or be the adult that you want them to be, um, and because so many people. They get angry at their kids, and they yell, and they shout, and they throw things, and and and, and they're like, "Why don't you? Why are you listening to me?" You know, and I, and I look at people like that, and I'm like, "Is that how you want your child to be? Is that you want you want your child to act? Who is the mature adult here? <laughs> you know, children are, um, you know, inherently immature in many places, including emotion. So you need to be." the model right so you need to calm down <laughs> you need to take a deep breath <laughs> and uh and uh especially um my mother-in-law she's a little bit like this as well and i'm constantly telling her this which pitches her off but uh but i say it anyway <laughs> um and then um there's another another thing that ca- you kind of remind me of is that when uh, when kids fall and they get hurt and they're crying and then uh, on top of the pain of all that, I guess humiliation as well, parents get angry at their kids for falling. And like, again, you know, adding salt to the wound and uh, and how it's it's um, it's difficult. Like I find myself sometimes almost doing that. And I'm like, all right, take a deep breath. Calm down. They didn't get they didn't fall on purpose. <laughs> it was an accident. And so, you know, I have to calm down and like, and, you know, help them up and, you know, comfort them. So or or some parents even go even worse than that like they don't, they don't they don't even get angry some parents don't even look at their kids they're like oh he just wants attention oh my god that that breaks my heart when i hear that um <laughs> like they're just crying yeah. for attention oh my god just gives me like, i think there's um chills. a lot of parents that's pretty tragic that right. they didn't really schedule the learning that seemingly you and i did before being a parent and while being a parent they didn't schedule understand the time and the money that this would cost <laughs> If if you chose to have a child, but you didn't choose to have the actual money to spend the time with your child, and you're always sending them somewhere else, taking them somewhere else, outsourcing all of this time of your child to someone else, mm-hmm. I, I, I see that as kind of ill-conceived, like not really thinking about it. And, and of course, for many parents to actually bear witness to that, that, mm-hmm. wow, Look at how look at the job you're doing right now. How much time do you really spend with your child? Mm-hmm. And this, of course, is an advantage that you have as a homeschooler. Um, and at some point, I, I definitely am curious about your studies of autodidacticism and self-directed learning of children and so-called unschooling. Um, you familiar with that term? Oh, of course. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I guess we we gotta we'll we'll do this for another time. <laughs> Maybe we'll do another. Yeah, yeah well, that'll be next one. Yeah, yeah, that's sure. a yeah, that's a that's an awesome topic as well on schooling. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we will definitely have you back on. <laughs> it seems like this conversation is unfinished. So, um, but yeah, so please, um, before we go, just um, let everyone know uh, where they can find you, how they can reach you, if they want to follow you. Right on. Please, uh, you can certainly look my name up on Facebook and certainly go to voluntaryvisions.com. You can definitely contact me email-wise, Daryl, at voluntaryvisions.com. How to spell my name is right there in the show notes for this show. And I would say for people who are looking for holistic healthcare consulting, I do that for people around the world when necessary to find people proficient solutions to their healthcare problems to find how to research and find a proficient holistic healthcare provider in your area wherever the hell you are <laughs> and that you can you can still reach me through daryl at voluntaryvisions.com awesome and uh, and another question i often ask my guests is um what is your favorite quote of all time so i think i'll go with the <sighs> victor frankel one because it's really cool. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our ability to choose our response. And in our response is our freedom. Ooh, I like and that. And if I didn't get that correct, uh, then that's a close paraphrase of Viktor Frankl's quote. Wow. He was someone who uh, survived one of those <sighs> uh, concentration camps back in World War II. Mm. Wow, very cool. I never heard that quote. That's really awesome. 
Wow. Great conversation, um, Daryl. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Really appreciate it. So if anybody wants to help me out, uh, you can do so through Bitcoin, uh, PayPal, or Patreon. Links are below in the description. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. If you find value in this content, please feel free to donate. Value for value. That's um, that's the capitalist way. Right? I, I respond to incentives uh, like any other person. <laughs> so, um, you know, this, although this is a free, uh, free content, it was not free to make, right? There's always opportunity cost to everything we do. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this is Danilo from peacefanicism.com on the voluntary virtues network and the seeds of liberty.com and the conscious resistance.com wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.